Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Maraboros que tal a derriga da moça, chadela da derriga da moça. Ei, que vos me canto que vos me dá a derriga da moça. In the end of days, as old as you are, you will never change. You are called the I am because you are and you will always be. And you have always been. Father, we worship you. We give you praise. Hallelujah. In the end of days, as old as you are, as old as you are, you will never change. I want to declare over you today that word prophetically that not only would you reason logically along with that expression, but that faith will rise in your heart to the truth of that statement that your heavenly father has been before anything else ever came to be. And he is with you now in time. And he's also waiting for you in eternity. Once you have that confidence in the one that is called the I am. Yeah, awesome, awesome. You know what, let's be seated, praise the Lord. Let's just be seated where we're at. And um, we'll get into a couple of things real quick. Um, so Chris, the Lord would have me say to you that this is not a season to be afraid or to underestimate. This is not your underestimation season. Okay, because the ones that have been assigned to come along with you, they are moving very fast. And they don't want you to slow them down. So do not underestimate in the season that we're in. I want to pray for four people very, very quickly. You see, there is grace in this place today for direction. Grace for what? For direction. And so if you are, if you're one of my four people, I just want to pray for you real quick. Real, real quick. And what it is, is you have been waiting on the Lord for clarity because you seem to have multiple options, but you just want to know which one it is. So there is grace for clarity in here today. Praise the Lord. That's my person number one. Oh yeah, no, I said four people, so don't worry. You can still come. God is good. Alrighty, so I'm going to tell you one or two things very quickly. Praise the Lord. Okay, God is good. Are you here as one or... You're here for her. Okay, God is good. Alrighty. Oh, yes. Uh, because the reason why is that the question that I saw hanging over you, both of you were holding it. And so whatever you need clarity concerning, you are here as one. So, so once, once that instruction comes, you will know because there will be a witness in one for the other. So I'm going to start with you real quick. As soon as you got up, the Lord said to me to say to you, and I want you to glean on the word as well that whether you turn to the right or to the left, you will hear a voice. You see, you're turning to the left and to the right because there are options. You're looking at this, you're looking at that. But the Lord is saying, it is not what you're seeing, it is not what they're pointing out to you. It is not what you have even weighed upon the scales. The Lord is saying that you will hear a voice. So what do you do? You stay attentive for that voice. Please, if you would come close. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, um, Sister Josephine, I want you to turn around, but before you do, I'm going to tell you exactly what the Lord revealed to me. What is being said to you can only be understood if you can see it. You will hear it, but it will make sense if you see it. And the Lord is saying you're not yet facing the direction of where the sign is being displayed. So just as a symbol of your recognition of the word of God, I would want you to physically in here, turn around in the direction where my wife is. And I declare over you that in the mighty name of Jesus, that your eyes will be open as I lay my hands on you today 
for the stirring up of the gifts that are already on the inside of you. The gift of wisdom to know what the Lord is saying unto the churches in the mighty name of Jesus. That was only expected because the light hit her because now she can see what is being shown. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because you have started a new thing, a new thing, a new thing. You see, uh, I'm going to pray for you later because your direction is going to come as you give direction to another, but I'll, I'll explain that in just a moment. So let me pray for this woman, okay? And your confirmation is going to come from him. You, you already knew that, you see? So here is the deal. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. So the decision is already made and you are in agreement with it. But for some reason, even though you're in agreement with it, you have yet to fully accept it. It's like, man, is that really it? And the Lord is saying, yes, it is it. Let your eye be single and your entire body will be full of light. In the name of Jesus, let it be made clear now, even this moment, in the mighty name of Jesus. Embrace that message that the Lord brings to you today. Through the ministry of his angels, the scroll of God's instruction has been presented to you. You will know exactly what to do in details. How awesome is that? The Lord has accepted your plan. The Lord has received your willingness. You see, he said, I have seen their devotion and now I have granted unto them the light that they may see very clearly. You will see very clearly. It's just gonna be like, wow, okay, really? If I so clear that you would say, I hear you say, Really? Which, why, why did it take so long? We should have just known. It is coming in this season. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this woman right here. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, I hear Manuel Lida speak to the wall. So let me explain to you what I've seen. You shall speak to the wall. You know, the, the, the reason why you're, where you're at is because you haven't heard what you're saying. Remember the story of King Hezekiah. What happened to him was the prophet said to him, you have only but a few days to live. Put your house in order. What did he do? He turned around and he faced the war and he prayed and the Lord added to him 15 years. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Speak to the wall that you may hear that which the Lord has put in your mouth the word of life, the word of faith, the word of providence, the word of promotion, now in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for this woman as an added bonus that in this season, she will see the ladder that the angels are upon. You will see it. I'm not just talking about you will imagine it, you will see it. The Lord will open your eyes in Bethel to see the ladder that the angels are ascending and descending upon. In the mighty name of Jesus, it is a bonus of faith upon you. Right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Open your eyes, what do you see? You see the love of God being made manifest. In the mighty name of Jesus, walk in that light. Every thought that comes, bring it to the test. Bring every thought to the test. If it doesn't line up with the love of your heavenly Father, shut it down. Bring every thought to captivity, even to the obedience of Christ, in Jesus' name. I saw you pointing the way to another. This person seems to be one of your family, maybe like a child of yours. And you saw them at a junction and they were totally confused, not knowing where to go. And you were like, yeah, you go that way. The moment you pointed, you saw what you have been looking for. So come close. In the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, because your word says, he that waters must be watered also. As this woman is used as an agent of light in the life of another to provide direction so willingly, so confidently, and so graciously, the light will shine upon where she must go. Right now in the mighty name of Jesus, let it be unveiled to her in Jesus' name. I want you to say, Lord, I receive it. I, receive I am it. thankful for it. Thankful for and I will go where you lead. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to be genuinely thankful that God is using you in the life of another. Because there is so much tied, so much tied to where that person needs to be. And so you know what? Not only would you be a part of the miracle, you would also be a part of that reward in the name of Jesus. That reward will be a part of you in the mighty name of Jesus. It is not yours to convince them. It is yours to point to them the way that they must go. And once you see what you need to do, you just keep going. 
If they come asking you afterward, can you explain that? Just tell them, I have told you what the Lord showed to me. Because you know what? It is their test, not yours. You understand what I mean? It is their test, not yours. And so once you tell them, let them get by themselves with the Lord to where they need to be light on their feet to go where the Lord leads. In the mighty name of Jesus, you're not convincing, you're not explaining, you are only declaring as the Lord reveals to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, let your words be few in that conversation so that you do not give room to the devil. Let your word be few because argument is hanging at the door confusion is waiting at the door but when your words are few guess what happens they have nothing to work with and the person can work with the seed sown of the word of life in the mighty name of Jesus and Lord I thank you because in fact as I'm speaking to you you can see it you can see how that conversation will go give God thanks because nothing will be amiss in the mighty name of Jesus praise the Lord Tonight, by the grace of God, I would like to get us started. Laura, good to see you. I know Saturdays have been busy, but I'm glad to see you here. And it's a joy to have our brother Thomas here with his wife. Good to see you. Glad you're here. And um, today, very quickly, I would like for us to, actually, let me close this because there is a little exercise that we need to perform real quick. I want you to, as much as possible, Imagine yourself introducing others to Jesus. I want you to just take a moment. You see, because in our gatherings, quite often we focus a lot on teaching people how to speak, how to ask. But that is only half or part of the privilege that we have, right? We teach people just like Jesus told his disciples. When they asked him, they said, Lord, John, we know that he taught his disciples how to pray because some of us used to be his disciples. So we knew, but you haven't said anything about the order of prayer. And Jesus was like, yeah, sure, I can teach you. He says, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And then you know, as it goes on and on. But more than that, we also need to teach people and we need to learn under the Holy Spirit individually in our closets on our own how to also imagine. Because God has a commitment to Chris and his wife that he will do for them exceedingly abundantly above what they ask or imagine. There are certain things that I didn't, I dared not ask God because I could barely imagine it and the Lord still did it. So I tell you what, let your imagination work for you today. I want you to imagine yourself introducing people to Jesus. Jesus arrives, you see him first and you're so passionate to let other people know that he was there, that he, had, that he has come. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you. Praise the Lord. And I'll tell you the reason why we've had to do that. Okay, now let's stop dreaming now because I know that some of y'all have gone beyond introducing Jesus to people now in your imagination. Like, so Jesus, what about all that stuff that I've been asking you? Oh, Jesus, why don't you touch my back? Heal me real quick. Jesus, this and Jesus, that. One of the things that the Lord said to me very clearly as we were getting ready for tonight's meeting was this. He said to me, he said, if they would come for me, they would find all else that they seek. But if you're coming for the things, you may get some, but there's no way of getting all. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except by me. And so we, as children of God, we're accustomed to, if I'm maybe not just accustomed, we prefer to deal with the Father. And I'll tell you why. Because a lot of us, we have stayed children for so long in our faith. 
And children like to depend very greatly on the father. Don't get me wrong. All of us as dear children of God should not get to a point of maturity when we believe that we no longer need God. But what I mean by us relating to the father is because as a child, when something hurts, you want to cry to the father because you want him to do something about it. You're walking aimlessly and you bump into a piece of furniture and you cry. You want your dad to tell the furniture off. And so because many of us have had that mindset for so long, even though we pray in the name of Jesus, most of us really are going for the Father. Because he is the provider. It says, the Bible says, and my God, the Father, shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And so we go for the Father all the time because the Bible says that inheritances are given by fathers, but a good wife is from the Lord. Your God is your Father. And so he is the one that gives you the, that inheritance. The Bible says the Lord is my portion in the land of the living. And so this is what many of us are doing. We see Jesus standing there and we're like, Jesus, ain't got time for you right now. I need the Father. And let me, let me tell you, you don't get the Father that way. The only people that have been able to get to the Father that way are the people that the Father chose to come to himself. But if you will approach the Father, you have to come through the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the significance of that? The significance of coming through the Lord Jesus Christ is beginning, is, is having a deep appreciation for his Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father. He says, no one comes to the Father but by me. But that same Jesus let us know that the way that we would enjoy his ministry, the way that we will enjoy his person is by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the God that is with us, the one that has been called to be alongside with us. He says, I am going, and for a while, I will be at the right hand of the Father. In the meantime, you have the Holy Spirit. And that is the reason why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. And so if we are not seeking to develop that relationship, relationship with the Holy Spirit, we are unable to, act, to, to receive or fully experience the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And without the one who calls himself the door, you cannot get to the Father. So all of those things that you desire for your heavenly Father to do is very possible the moment you start to engage Jesus by his Holy Spirit. And so when we come to the presence of God and we're just coming for things, we're shortchanging ourselves because we should only come for the Lord Jesus. And once we come for him, we have everything that we need. The Bible says in him is the fullness of the Godhead. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 8. He said, if God the Father did not withhold Jesus the Son from us, will he not together with him freely give us all things? I want to encourage you Stop focusing on the things that you need, the things that you are missing. Focus on the Jesus that is missing you. We focus, let me say that again, a lot on the things that we've identified that I'm missing this in my life. I am missing that in my life. What about the one that is missing you? Jesus says, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I have received you into my father's kingdom. And what is that kingdom? Righteousness, peace, and joy. So Jesus is saying, until you're at peace, until your joy is full, until you live in the full reality of what it means to be the righteousness of God, I am not resting. I am not drinking. I am waiting anticipatorily until you get there. So he's missing you and he's longing for you, but you are busy longing for things. I've told you several times before, the reason why many of us don't hear God is because we want to talk to God about what God is not interested in talking about. We always want to bother God about things. We want to keep describing our problems to God. We keep telling God about things that God has already taken care of. You want to drag yourself back and God is like, I'm not going to partner with you in that mission. I've already delivered you from that. So if you want to go back, I'll be right here. 
You can go back if you want. It's your choice, but I will be right here. And God wants, so God wants to talk to you about the things of the kingdom because you're a kingdom agent. And when you focus on the kingdom things, all these other things will be added unto you. If you have already come to that place of peace as Solomon, Rehoboam is going to be a natural delivery. And that's for the people who were here two weeks ago and three weeks ago. If you want, I'm quoting from Matthew chapter 1 verse 7. In the genealogy of Jesus Christ, there was a man called Solomon. Solomon gave birth to a man called Rehoboam. And Rehoboam gave, back, gave birth to Abiah. That is spelled Abijah in your Bible. But it's actually Abiah because that J is like hallelujah J. It's a Y. Abiah also then gave birth to who? Olivia, don't answer because I see your note is open. Who, who did Abiah give birth to? Give birth to? Asaph. Yeah, in most Bibles it's called Asaph, but it's Asaph. Asaph, Asaph. Asaph means the Lord my healer, the Lord my, the cura. The little, so it's different from Rapha. Asaph is cura, not just healer. You understand what I mean? And so, um, and do, do you know the difference between being healed and being cured? Okay, when you're healed, there's a very, there's the likelihood of a relapse is possible. Some of us have been healed from the flu before, but you're not yet cured from the flu because you can have it again. Can I say that one more time? You can be healed, but not cured. Because when you're healed, it means the symptoms have been taken care of. And the root cause has been made, what? Domicile. It's been made, it's been made, uh, what's the word? It's been neutralized, but not eliminated. Okay? To be cured is to actually have whatever it is that afflicted you in the first place completely dealt with so that you can be sure that affliction will not arise a second time. So that is the difference, you know? I know that we like the word healing, oh, heal me, heal me, heal me, heal me. But you see, healing and being made whole are very different. To be cured is to be made whole. Remember the man who brought Jesus, who brought the disciples, his child that was demon possessed. And just like many believers today, the disciples decided to engage in the debate rather than in the demonstration of the power. And the Bible says, after going back and forth with the man, look, if you can't heal the boy, call Jesus. But they couldn't heal the boy and they decided to start to justify all the reasons why the problem was with the man and his son and not them. We need to leave that place. We need to leave that place of trying to explain to people that they are the problem, whereas it's partially true, but you are supposed to be the solution. So that we quit giving excuses for why we can't be we can't forgive people, we give excuses for why we can love certain people, we give excuses for why we don't feel free and joyful to bless certain people because we have just concluded that they are the problem. But yes, that's the reason why God has loved you with his unconditional love as an example to you of how to love somebody else unconditionally. So rather than debating with your emotions as to whether to go ahead to do the will of God, which is to be at peace with all men in holiness, you will just freely give as you have freely received. And they were debating with Jesus, I mean with, with, the, with the man, and the man saw Jesus in the distance. But because he was in need, he was like, you know what, if these believers in church cannot see past my problem, I will go to the one who says, come unto me, and, and I will not cast you away. So the man beckoned to Jesus. Jesus saw him, got his attention. They engaged one another. And after Jesus casted out the demon, you know, Jesus did a little interview for the man so that the disciples can learn. Because Jesus already knew what was going on, but for their sake, he said, how long has this been going on? Do you know that some of the people that you engage and you struggle with, God brings them your way so that what is in you that shouldn't be can be revealed? God already knows that you're dealing with anger problems. But because you are always surrounded by nice people, you don't know the anger is there. And so that's why God is going to bring you somebody that is beyond unreasonable. God will bring you an internet troll that always responds to your comment. And no matter what you say, even if you say praise the Lord, they're like, which Lord are you talking about? Are you talking about Baal? 
Because the word bow means Lord. You know, so, so when I say that again, you see, there are people like that. They come for your sake. Because God wants to reveal what's in you. Jesus could have said to that demon in that instant, be gone, right? But he says, how long has it been going on? And the man was like, oh, way too long. And then that prompted the man to also describe the symptoms. He says he would throw him in the water, sometimes throw him in the fire. This demon is a troubling demon. You know, just so that the disciples can know the kind of work at hand. Because sometimes we think that we're ready. Just because Jesus used you the other day to minister to someone at Kroger doesn't mean you have now become an evangelist like no other. You understand what I mean? Because you prayed for someone's headache to go and immediately it left. You're like, you see, that's me. <laughs> Don't mess with me now, I'm on fire. I'm saying that today for someone's sake. God wants to move you forward. But because of the miracles of yesterday, you have decided to build a tent on the Mount of Transfiguration. The Mount of Transfiguration was an experience of activation. It was not a place of destination. And Jesus told his disciples, don't build a tabernacle here. You have work to do. You know, many of us were like the disciples. This same account that I'm telling you about, remember the genesis of the account was what? Jesus empowered his disciples, sent them out in twos. And the Bible says he gave them power over evil spirits and gave them the power to heal the sick and raise the dead. He gave them the same power that they were now lacking. Because when he gave it to them, he gave it to them for an assignment and for a season. He wasn't expecting them to make it their ministry going forward. Your ministry should not be your accomplishment. Your ministry should always be your obedience. Your dedication to the Lord should always be to go wherever he sends. And so when the disciples came back, the Bible says they came back with testimonies of how God used them mightily, and they were even saying amongst themselves and telling Jesus that, Jesus, I, we don't know how you did it, but demons were bowing down to us. They were getting ready to go print T-shirts, Demon Busters Incorporated. <laughs> These guys were ready to forget about fishing. They were ready to sell their boats and buy a building. You understand what I mean? They were ready to go because they're like, and so God saw that they won't get in the picture. So he decided to bring a man with a kind of demon that the little power that they were given, not little because you know when God gives something, he gives something big, but compared to what he's about to give them was not all that he has for them. Be encouraged. There's a woman in here today. This word is for you. Um, I will try not to look in your direction because sometimes I have the gift of gaze. <laughs> but you are here and the Lord is saying, I didn't stop loving you. I didn't change my mind about being a father to you. But the reason why it appears as though the blessings stopped, or even in some cases appeared that the blessings were accidental because it was like, if that was God, why isn't this one happening too? The Lord is saying, I did that for your sake because I want you to keep moving. I didn't want you building the tabernacle around the five loaves and two fish when there is still the miracle of resurrection. You know, many of us, once our appetites of the carnal needs are satisfied, we stop and we no longer pursue the righteousness of the kingdom. God has supernatural spiritual experiences that he wants to give to you, but you just want to stay in the place of bread and fish. You understand what I mean? God has more. And so stop questioning the love of God. He loves you. Stop questioning the faithfulness of God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Your experiences are a direct function of your lack of cooperation with the wind of God, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was willing to move you, but you're like, Holy Spirit, don't move me from here. This miracle is amazing. And the Holy Spirit is like, no, no, no. What is ahead is even more amazing. You need to learn how to move. And so God will come sometimes to shake you up with a mute spirit. That spirit was described as a mute spirit. And Jesus says, okay, now that we have heard and everybody's known what's really going on in here, that this is a mute spirit that does not go but by prayer and fasting. Can somebody say fasting? Because you know that we have become so psychedelic or sophisticated in this generation that when people say fasting, people leave the room. 
because people don't like to fast. Fasting is inconvenient for the most part, but if you fast at the word of the Lord, it's always a glorious experience. But some of us, God has told us to fast several times, but we think about our own inability and we do not. Let me say this, Isaiah 58, God says, is this the fast that I called? When God calls a fast, when God called a fast for Moses, the Bible says for 40 days and 40 nights, Moses did not eat and he did not drink. That is a supernatural strength. None of us can go for 40 days without food, without water. But when God calls it, he also does it. But God's always told you to fast, but you're like, God, you know that if I haven't had coffee by 7.45 in the morning, and I dare to go to work, I'm a, I would definitely offend somebody. You understand what I mean? And so you're like, God, I will fast, but I will drink coffee. And God is like, nah, that's not the fast that I have called. And so you decide to have coffee, and that's not the fast that God has called for you. And so what happens is this. Your flesh now uses that as an opportunity to, to reveal your weakness, to punish you very greatly. Such that by 10.45 in the morning, you're beginning to see stars that are not there. <laughs> your stomach begins to sing all kinds of choruses on the string instrument. Your intestines stretch out like the strings on the guitar and you can hear the music calling out all kinds of foods. And you're like, definitely God didn't ask me to fast because if he asked me to fast, I shouldn't be this hungry. It's only 10.45. I'm going to go have a sandwich. But... If you had done it the way the Lord has commanded, I mean, obviously you know that I'm speaking from experience. You see what I mean? So don't think I'm just talking about you, I'm talking about us. This is what we do. You understand what I mean? But if the Lord is saying, I want you to fast from morning till evening, not eating, not drinking, you don't need to help God. God is your help, you're not his help. Oh, thank God. You see what I mean? And so if he says, do it, do it, that is when you will find the strength. Will the temptation come? Oh, absolutely, all day, especially at 2 p.m. Will you feel the bite in your stomach? Yes, but the resolve, which is the power of determination, will arise within you to overcome every temptation so that when you finally break that fast at 6 p.m., you feel like you've accomplished something. So going back to the story of the man with the demon-possessed child, Jesus didn't just heal the boy because to heal is to remedy the situation. And that was what Jesus did at first. The Bible says, Jesus says, you mute spirit. You know what a mute spirit is in some of our lives? Those situations that you don't seem to understand. You know, you can't easily understand someone that is not talking to you. And there are situations that we go through that are mute situations. You're speaking to them, you're declaring the word of God, but they're not speaking back to you. They're just looking at you. And after a while, you get so frustrated and you feel like the word of God is not powerful. It is powerful. It's just that you're missing certain ingredients. And so Jesus says, you mute spirit. Be gone. And the Bible says immediately the spirit convulsed him on his way out. One last torment before he goes. So don't be afraid when the situation that you're in, a difficult situation seems to be more difficult suddenly. No, that's on its way out. Can I say that again? The Bible says that spirit convulsed the child greatly. Just one more time. As it was going. But you know that is the moment wherein some people just curse God and die. Because they're like, well, God, I can't take this anymore. If you're not going to be nice to me, don't be my God. I'll go find another. I'm going to go God shopping. But the Bible says the spirit convulsed him greatly one more time. And the boy fell to the ground as though he was dead. Which is a huge dilemma. Because we brought a living child for you to heal. But now you killed him. I'm better off without your ministry, Jesus. How many times have we said that? Because that little job that you were doing that was paying money that was not enough because you heard God telling you to move forward with an idea that is given to you. And now, three months into being an entrepreneur, you can't even afford to buy that sandwich, that sandwich that breaks your fast at 10.45. And you're like, God, I was okay. At least I could pay my phone bills while I was earning this salary. But at your word, I moved and look at me now. 
I seem to be better off. And what happens is many people terminate the miracle right there. Many of us, the problem with us is, number one, like my wife says, we don't have faith. And when we even have faith, we don't have the patience to sustain the faith. I've explained this to you in several ways in the last two, three weeks. I'm going to give you another explanation real quick and then I'm going to pull all of these things together. Faith opens the door. Patience keeps it open for long enough for all the blessings to come through. Can I say that again? When you have faith, it can open the portals of eternity. But faith happens like that in an instant. Oh, that's why the Bible says now, faith is. No faith will continue to be. Faith does its work in an instant. But you need patience to sustain that portal. What did I tell you about last, I mean, two weeks ago or so? No, last week, just two teachings ago, thereabouts. I said to us that many of us, we don't have any problems engaging the mercy of God. The Bible says, come boldly before the throne of grace, wherein you obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. We get a glimpse of what God has for us when we come to his presence. Because in his mercy, he allows for us to see the river. And you're excited, but guess what happens? It closes in front of you and you're like, that's it? The mercy will open the throne to you, but your praise and worship will keep it open. That is the reason why we need to know about engaging God in his presence, in praise, and in worship. We cannot overemphasize the significance of magnifying the Lord because he inhabits the praises of his people. Now, that's for those people who weren't here uh, Saturday last week, but for those of you that were here, it's okay to hear it again. But the example and the illustration of today is that faith will open the portal, but your patience will keep it going. Faith was the reason why you resigned from that job at the word of the Lord to go pursue that idea, but patience is what will sustain you until that idea becomes the blessing. The Bible says it is through faith and patience that we inherit the promises. It is not just faith alone. Abraham had faith, but he had to be patient also with God. So we need to learn how to be patient with God. This man was patient with Jesus, even though he was looking at the lifeless body of his child on the ground, he said not a word. So that was part of the healing process. And eventually Jesus picked up the boy. He was alive, brand new, healed, but not cured. And Jesus was waiting to see the man's reaction. And the man started to give glory to God. He started to praise God for the miracle that they had just experienced. And that was when Jesus cured the boy. He said to that spirit in that moment, do not return. That was the cure. You see, many of us, what's plaguing us now has plagued us before. Spring of 87, you will never forget, but the Lord delivered you. But the word of the Lord says, affliction will not arise a second time. Yes, it will not arise if it's been cured, not just healed. And so Jesus said to that spirit, do not return because mute spirits are seasonal spirits. They have, they have seasons, they keep coming back. So you need to be healed and you need to be cured. You know exactly what I am talking about because healing is not all that you're after. You need to be cured. You need to get to the point where you know that Jesus has already rebuked the spirit and told the spirit not to come back. Many of us, even in our spousal relationships, there are times where you hold, you, you're, you're pulling out your hair and you're like, I thought my husband was over this already. I thought my wife was over this already. Where did this come from? I thought we've been through this already. Yeah, it's back because you never told it not to come back. She was healed in that season. You were healed in that season. But guess what? The flu potential or the propensity for having that flu is still in you. It needs to be taken out. You need Asaph. You need the cure. 
And that is the reason why we need to be at peace always because Asaph came from a buyer that that confidence that Jehovah is your father and Abiah came from Rebo Rehoboam that understanding and wisdom that guess that what that God is the one that enlarges your tent all of them came from Solomon which means the peaceful man so first of all before all else you need to be at peace the rattling of the tent Chris you may have to give a special offering today because all these words seem to be coming just for you. I'm just kidding. I said that for people online who get excited about, you know, people asking for money for prayers. No, I'm just kidding. We don't do that here. But I'm just saying that I saw the tent being rattled. You see, the Lord says, do not settle for the mundane. Okay? Do not cut yourself short. For the sake of the ones that the Lord has assigned to you, they're moving very speedily. The Lord is saying to you, this is, again, I, say, I see it written very boldly. And it's going to make more sense to you as the days unfold. But the Lord is saying to you, this is not your season for underestimation. Don't underestimate the grace of God that is upon your life. Don't underestimate the help that is next to you. Do not underestimate anything in this season. You see, and the rattling of the tent that I see is the, angel, the angels of the Lord are removing the pegs so that they can stretch out the tent. But for a moment you were afraid. And the Lord is saying, fear not because I am with you. You understand what I mean? Fear not for I am with you. You need to maintain a praise and worship life like never before. What God is doing in your life requires the constant activity of the angelic and you sustain that in praise and worship. You see, because they are the angels of God's presence and the presence of God, how do you create that? The Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. You keep magnifying the Lord. And living the life of worship is not just about singing worship songs from YouTube. Living the life of worship simply means magnifying the name of God at all times. When you have a headache and you feel uncomfortable, you magnify the name of the healer. When you feel broke, you magnify the name of the provider. When you feel like you're literal, you magnify the name of the one who is called the greater one that is in you, that is greater than the one that is in the world. You need to constantly have the Lord on your mind. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Because I was asking, will you let me say this? And he says, now you can say it. When my wife came up, she said this to us. She said, let the Lord feel your thoughts. You need to have the Lord in your thoughts. Many of us don't hear God because we don't talk to God. You see, but that got to the point wherein God is like, okay, okay, okay. Okay. What do you want? You understand what I mean? Let God be the one to tell you that you're doing too much when it comes to engaging him. I'm not saying keep repeating the same thing when you're praying to God. That's not what I mean. The, Jesus says the heathen, they pray with much repetition of words thinking that their gods will hear them. Don't be like them. That's what Jesus says. I'm not saying go back to God every time and say, God, bless me. I need that car. I need that promotion. No, 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 no. The father knows what you have need of before you even ask. I'm talking about getting God involved in everything you're doing. I know that God is your father, not your mother, but sometimes still ask him what you should put on. Now God, do you like this shirt? You understand what I mean? You know, because I heard a pastor say once before, oh, don't be bothering the Holy Spirit with questions like, oh, which shoes should I wear? He said, God is your father, not your mother. Uh, okay, so who's my mother then? No, because the one that was called our mother in scripture, is one of the seven spirits of God. Wisdom is called our mother. The Bible says wisdom is on the streets calling out to see if her children will return. Wisdom is our mother because it is by wisdom that we all were birthed. In Proverbs chapter 8, she said to Solomon, she says, before the Almighty began his work, he possessed me. Even before the primal dust of the earth was formed, God conceived all of his ideas in the womb of wisdom. And wisdom is one of the spirits of God. And so if, if you're telling me that God is not my father and uh, is not my mother, who, to whom shall I go? To Ashtoreth, God forbid, that we'll go back to the dark after having brought into the light. The reason why many of us are so desperately dependent on the system is because we haven't recognized that God is also your mother as the El Shaddai, the big-breasted one. So every time you need comfort, you go to the credit card. Every time you need comfort, you go to the government. And the Lord is saying, I am to you all that you will ever need. Come, come and rest in my bosom. I got you. 
I can rock you to sleep. I can be your mother if you need me to. These things are very critical because many of us, we don't engage God enough. I tell you, I call my parents and when I call them, in fact, I can't remember really the last time that I dialed my dad's number. And the reason being, at his age, I don't expect him to go for too long without being next to his wife. And that happens every time I call, he's right there. Even if he's not there in the view of the video call, I will hear his voice somewhere. And be like, hey, uh, have you seen my glasses? I don't know, he looks for his glasses all the time. Don't you think by now he would have a rope and tie it to his shirt somewhere? But I can't, don't tell him I said that. Okay. But guess what? I call my mom simply because we always have more to talk about. My dad is 80, almost 80 years old. And sometimes, even if I attempt to call him directly, the conversation is always brief. You guys doing good? That's awesome. That is awesome. Is the weather being kind to you people? Oh, that's great. Now let me get your mom. That's what he says. That's it. But many of us don't realize that we operate with God like that sometimes and we're in God's presence and after two minutes you feel like there's nothing to say because you have decided that today I'm not going to ask for anything. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to impress God with my not being beggarly today. I'm just going to say, God, today I'm not asking for anything. And God knows that in your heart you are screaming for help. You understand what I mean? But you're like, I'm not asking for anything today. God, I just want to bless you. I love you. I appreciate you. The one who knows your heart, you better tell him what your problem is real quick and get it over with. You understand what I mean? And, but because of the fact that we have not come to engage the wisdom, motherly side of God, we run out of things to say. Many of us in this room, you know what I'm talking about. With your mom, there's never a, a dull moment. There's always something to talk about. Even if it's about other people. I say that very respectfully because sometimes God wants to talk about other people. The Bible says that the heart of God is with the oppressed. And so God wants to tell you about people that he wants to send you to bless. He wants to talk to you about his other children so that you can partner with him in intercession for their deliverance. Not because God cannot deliver. He can deliver anybody he wants, but he has chosen to make us his partner so that we can be carriers of his glory. And so God wants to talk about other people. Do you know that I, have, I, I had to learn that the hard way? Because every time I just want to talk to God about my own little business. And after a while, God said to me, he was like, okay, we've heard. But have you considered this person and what they're going through? How about if we do something about it? And let me tell you something. My prayer life changed. I was about maybe 11 or 12 years old. The moment I realized that intercession is such an interest in, it's a powerful area of interest for God. What is Jesus' full-time ministry? Intercession. The Bible says he forever lives to make intercessions for us. The word forever there is the word rooted. Is the, the root of that word is the same word that translates to perpetual. That means that is his full-time ministry interceding for you and I. And so when anybody goes into intercession, what happens is they let you in from the waiting room into God's office because in God's office, that's what they do. So if you want to be close to God, love people. Pray for people. Set your own little issues aside and say, God, I, I hear these things that you're prophesying or that your son is prophesying concerning Chris and his, and his family. What part can I play in that? Can I see a vision concerning them too? Not, just, not so that I can feel like I, I have the gifts of the Spirit, but so that I can play a part in that. You, you have great things for them. How can I help? Anyway, our time is fast spent, but I want to show us something very quickly here. We read this scripture of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, but we didn't dwell on it too much, and um, I believe that we just need to touch on it again, and, and we can finally move on from, move on from it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So, Alan, I see you with a bell. As soon as you walked in, I heard very clearly that the bell ringer is here. The Lord is calling you not just a watchman, but a bell ringer. You know that earlier today, I kept saying to you repeatedly, if, I'm not sure if you noticed, that we are watchmen, we are watchmen, we are watchmen, we are watchmen. But you see, a watchman that is thoroughly equipped is one who has a bell in his watchtower to sound the alert. 
The Lord has given you such a glorious grace to announce to others of who is coming, not just what is coming. You see why worship was on today. You saw me, I was there on my face at some point in time, and that was because I just, I, I could hardly contain what I was seeing where I was. I was taking up in the spirit, and I saw an army more than my eyes could see. I couldn't see the end of them. An innumerable army, but I saw their captain, and it was the Lord. And without anybody telling me what to do, as soon as I saw him, I drew my sword and struck the ground as I was running across the multitude of people that were standing on the other side of the army and I was announcing to them, he is here, the deliverer is here. He is here, wipe your tears, he is here. You see, what we, are, we have come to the precipice of the revelation or the revealing of the Lord Jesus. He is our help. He is our deliverer. We cannot deliver ourselves from this 5,000 year old system of Nimrod. We are still in Babylon and the oppression is at an all time high because the deception has been energized by heaven. It was God himself who declared that power should be given to the dragon to deceive the nations. Before power was given to Satan, he wasn't doing badly in his oppression. But power has been given to him. And that is the reason why you look at people today and they still believe everything that is being said in the news. And you're looking at them. That what's going on, brother? And they're looking at you, calling you a conspiracy theorist. And that is because the hold of deception is empowered. This is not an ordinary deception. Let me say this again. This is the final deception. This is the deception before the revealing of the new heavenly Jerusalem. And what does the Bible say about that deception? The Bible says that deception will lead to tribulation such as men have never seen before. Do you know that that tribulation is, is, is on already? It's about to become great. That's why they call it the great tribulation. It's going to escalate. But even while the, the, the preliminary tribulation is on, some people don't know. Why? Because they can still go to the grocery store. They can still go on vacation. They can still take selfies. They can still text their friends and watch funny videos on TikTok. They don't know because the great tribulation is not a tribulation for the flesh of man. It's a tribulation for the soul of man. We haven't seen this many people living in deception. We have never seen this many people on earth following Satan so blindly, believing everything that the false prophet is saying. And we're still wondering whether the tribulation has begun it has begun because Satan is not after the flesh of man the flesh of man is temporal is fleeting it has almost no value to the ones who are eternal he's looking for souls of men that will stand in regimentation with him as he takes on the Lord Jesus Christ I mean of course they think they can so what are we talking about? We're talking about the fact that we're living in unprecedented times and the only one that can deliver us is the captain of our salvation. And he comes and he brings deliverance. And that was why I was so filled with joy to announce to other people. And when I got on here, the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, I want them to receive the same passion that you have received. I want them to enjoy the same experience that you have had. Tell them to come to it by their imagination. So when I came up here, I said, imagine yourself introducing people to Jesus. Now go back to what you imagined. What were you saying to people? Because that is the Jesus that you know. The Jesus you know is the Jesus that you introduce to other people. I was there and I'm glad that I was introducing him as the deliverer. I was introducing him as my kinsman redeemer, the one who has come to redeem me from this system of Satan, this Babylon, Babylonian system, this Sodom that we're in. Only Jesus can pull us out because we have been in Sodom for so long we do not want to leave. Just like Lot never wanted to leave. After Lot saw the angels of the Lord, he hosted the angels of the Lord in his house. They sat down together, they had fellowship. He knew they were angels. They performed miracles and still Lot did not want to follow them simply because of the fact that Sodom is a mammon system, right? You know, because I've 
I've studied Sodom and I shared with you some of my findings. Sodom was a place, Sodom and Gomorrah, they were twin cities that operated under the authority of mammon. Everything about their daily activities has got to do with money and they would do anything for money. Remember that they, would, they slapped the servant of Abraham when he went on assignment to check on Lot. They slapped him and they demanded for him to pay for the slap. And he was like, wait a minute, you just slapped me. Why should I pay you? And the man of Sodom said to him, because you could not have experienced the pain you have experienced if I didn't slap you. So pay me for the experience. The men of Sodom and Gomorrah were operating under the spirit of mammon and mammon has such a grip, grip on the souls of men. That is the reason why today you ask your average teenager where the, what they want to study and they will tell you, I want to be a gynecologist and you say to them, why? Oh, because you make money. Okay, almost everybody now is doing things for money. Why do you live where you live? Oh, because the property value here, we, we hear that it's gonna go up. Okay, every single person that you know is under the hold of mammon until they divorce themselves from it intentionally by asking God for help. Almost everybody, because that's what the system is. And it has, it has been like that since forever. It's all about the money, about the taxes, about how much you can be exploited, how much the best of you, what has God been telling us from the book of Jeremiah 17, 11, that we are the planting of the Lord, yet we keep offering the best of our incense to Baal, to Baal. Why? Because of the fact that the system is designed that way. If you think about it, the best of your time, the best of your day is spent chasing the mullah. People don't regard you if they don't think you have something to offer monetarily. And I'm going to wrap up on this note and we will read this after I say this. The Lord also said to me while we were in worship, he said this to me. He said, what is the root of all evil? I said, well, money. Money, the Bible says, not money, the love of money. The love of money is the root of all evil. It is not the seed of all evil. Let me, let's, let, let's, let's uh, talk about that for a minute. The seed of all evil is what? Sin. Sin is the seed of all evil, but for sin, for evil to take hold in your life, it needs to be deeply rooted. And that's where the love of money comes in. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Pedophilia is a sin that comes by the temptation of Satan exploiting the weakness of people either by demonic possession, demonic oppression, or generational curses, right? All of that is the sin. But what has sustained pedophilia in our society? The love of money. People will traffic children because they're getting paid for it. If you stop paying people for other people's children, trafficking will stop. People will still be pedophiles, but the, 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 it's not gonna be a rooted sin in our society. Why do people lie? People lie because sin is in the human nature that fell in Adam. But why do people make lying a career? Some politicians went into politics just so that they can exploit other people and they keep lying to do so. Why? Because the love of money constitutes the root of all evil. But on the flip side, the adoration of God is the root of all blessings. God blesses you because he's merciful. He blesses you because he's faithful. But those blessings will be rooted in your life if you choose to live a life of divine adoration all the time, giving God thanks in your heart always, singing hymns and spiritual songs. So don't continue to be a believer that only enjoys seasonal, spontaneous blessings. Become a believer that enjoys blessings that are deeply rooted by providing the root yourself, which is to choose the life of divine adoration. Don't worry, you can play that back again tomorrow night when you're watching it on YouTube. But I say this to you in the mighty name of Jesus. 
that you will arise to the occasion of the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be ready to announce that your kinsman redeemer lives. You'll be ready to go and meet him outside of the city before he comes to the tomb of Lazarus. You would enjoy that privilege and you will not miss out on it. Before the Lord Jesus' appearance is made for all to see, I pray that you will catch a glimpse of it so that you can use that to announce to those who are without to come into the ark. It is your God-given assignment. It is your ministry. It is your calling to bring others into the ark, but you cannot bring them in if you have not seen the Lord. So I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, it will be a season of revelation for you. We're going to break bread in a minute, and at Communion House, we encourage everybody to take of the body of Jesus and to drink of his blood. Don't let the devil say to you that, well, you've not been living right, and the Bible says those who take of the Lord's body unworthily have illnesses in their bodies even unto death. What it means to take of the Lord's body unworthily is to turn this communion from what it is, which is a moment of remembrance, into a feast. The Bible was very clear. He said because those men turned the, the Lord's body and that holy ritual into a feast wherein they drank and they ate unto their own detriment. But here we, come, we have come to know that the power of resurrection the power of salvation lies in the blood. Without the blood, there is no atonement for sin. Without the blood, thank you, Alan, there is no sanctification. So you don't have to be holy to take the communion. You take the communion to be holy. So I want to encourage you, go for the bread, go for the wine, go for the body, go for the blood. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I mean 2 verse 12. In fact, I just realized that I have eight more minutes. So I'm gonna give Alan five of those eight minutes. I'll take three. So here is the deal. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 19. Isaiah 17, sorry. This is gonna be our communion scripture. Praise the Lord. So let me explain this very quickly. The Lord just revealed to me, somebody just asked a question in here, that why did he preach like that? He kept on touching on so many places. He started here, he went here, he went there, he went there. Well, first of all, my name is Moses. And when you're Moses leading people from Egypt to the promised land, even though you could have done it in 11 months, you take 40 years, you take your time. You keep going to different places. It's part of the experience, okay? But specifically today, this is what the Lord is doing. And I'm only saying this because somebody asked the question, I heard it. You know, the Bible says deep cause to deep. When I'm here, I hear things that the Lord reveals from other people. Otherwise, how am I able to deliver that message directly to you that is yours? You know, when I came in, these women here, they said to me, they said, well, we can't wait to hear what you've got to say today because in the last couple of weeks, everything we talk about in the car is what you say from here. And I told them, we shall see. But I, I heard somebody say, why did he do that? This is the reason why I did that today, specifically. The Holy Spirit said to me, give me a very clear instruction through the ministry of his angel that was my guide in the place that I was during worship that you need to take them to the rooms that you went to. I was in the spirit and I went to several rooms and there were different things, different functions, different purposes. It is now left to you to avail yourself of the opportunity of listening to this message again. It's gonna be on YouTube and on Facebook from 6 p.m. tomorrow. This is not an advertisement because we're not making money from any one of those things. Whether you watch it or not, Jesus is still Lord. But for your sake, Paul said for me to say a thing to you twice is not grievous, but for you it is safe. I want to encourage you, go back, play it again. When you identify a room, stop there and ruminate on it. Meditate on it. Sustain. Alan, what did I tell you about meditation today? The angel of the Lord said to me in the early hours of this morning, he said to me, he says meditation is the key to sustaining the portal of revelation. When revelation comes, it allows for you to see, but meditation is what allows for you to receive. Many of us have seen things. You have seen and had a revelation that Jehovah Rapha is the Lord that heals you, but you have not meditated upon it enough for you to receive that healing. And so you give yourself a lot of frustration by just experiencing things by revelation. You listen to several people preach and teach. You study, you buy books, you read books, and there's revelations everywhere. But the Bible says that hope that is deferred continues to make the heart sick. You are filled with enough revelation. It's now time for you to enjoy some meditation time so that that which you have seen you can receive so 
Isaiah 17. Don't forget, I'm encouraging you. This is not it. This is the beginning of it. You need to hear it again and pause and take notes and meditate and ask God to minister life to you. Isaiah 17, we're going to read verse 3 and then we're going to jump to verse 11. Verse 3 says, The fortress also we seize from Ephraim, the kingdom from Damascus and the remnant of Syria. They will be as the glory of the children of Israel, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of God is about to be seen on the remnants. Amen. So tap into it, get ready for it. The way God is going to do it, okay, quickly, Alan, I'll take two of your five minutes, of your three minutes. You know, on Tuesday, I started sowing some seeds within us. So I'm going to do a quick test to see whether it's germinated enough to drop some more things on you. I told you that God was presented with a very serious situation about the corruption of the earth in Genesis 11. He was told that the watchers have fallen from grace. They have left their position and taken wives amongst the sons of men. So the sons of God came down and took wives amongst the sons of men and they started to teach these wives and the children that were born to them sorcery. Azazel taught them how to make weapons. And then you have the list of all of them in the accounts of our brother Enoch. And so they polluted the earth. And the archangels reported to God. They were watching God. Enoch said they were watching God for a while and said nothing. And after a while, they couldn't take it anymore. And they went to God and they said, God, we know that you know all things. But please, when are you going to attend to the situation on earth? So if you don't know that, you will not understand the reason why in Genesis, the Bible says, God spoke and it says, let us now go and confuse their language. The us he was talking about were the archangels that came to report to him what was going on and were like, okay, okay, let's go do something about it. But when they reported the case to him, as serious as it was, that men had been taught the art of dye making, now changing the natural colors of things to their own desires, changing the world that God made from its original glory to the glory of carnal desires. That is a serious thing. And all God could say about it initially was like, why are they using bricks instead of stone? Olivia came and asked me a question afterwards. She was like, Pastor, you asked a question, but you didn't finish it. You talked about why God will sometimes address what seems like just the mundane, the aesthetics. And I said to her, yes, because sometimes the strength of the structure of a building appears to be in the aesthetics. When you see somebody plaster a wall, stucco, and they stay there and they continue to smoothen the wall, they're not just doing that so that it can look fresh. They're doing that so that it can be tight enough to preserve moisture from corrupting the, the, the cinder blocks. They're making it that smooth so that it can be a perfect reflection of the sun so that that wall is not heated up unnecessarily. It looks to you like aesthetics, but in reality, it is the secret that holds the wall. And so when God says, why are they using bricks instead of stone? He wasn't just addressing the aesthetics. He's addressing something that is more critical. So let me say this. There is an organization that has been launched in the world to bring about a shift in global economy. And what are they called? They're called bricks. If you haven't heard about it, go and look it up. It stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. But the Holy Spirit said to me, even before I even looked at what the acronym means, he says they're using bricks instead of stone. And the Lord has shook his head at what they're doing. You see, we knew by revelation what they were supposed to be doing. They were supposed to use stone, which is to create economies that are based on the stone that God recommended on the gold. Remember in Genesis, God recommended the gold. He says the gold of that area is good. Good by God is standard. They're supposed to use it as the standard because it disallows men of manipulative abilities and interests to take advantage of others by unjust weights. But instead of using stone, they're using bricks. May the Lord help us to understand what he is doing in this world. Isaiah chapter 17, we're going to read verse 11. We've read three. Now look at what verse 11 says. And I want you to open your spirit to receive this word of the Lord that will equip you to 
walk upon your high places. In fact, there is a wall that you need to scale with this revelation. He says, in the day, you will make your plant grow. And in the morning, you will make your seed to flourish. But the harvest will be like a heap of ruins in the day of grief and desperate sorrow. Anything that will heap up that is not to the glory of God is going to become ruins. Get ready. I say this because the Lord sent me as an apostle to the body of Christ to address the issue of disappointment because many people will, dis will be disappointed at what the Lord is doing. I come to you today in the spirit of Daniel to whom the Lord revealed that when they say there's a casting down, you will say there's a lifting up. When that which this Western civilization, this Babylonian system has heaped up that is not of God, when it comes to ruin, some people will not know how to tell the difference between what God is doing and what man has failed to do. And their hearts will sorrow and they will gnash their teeth rather than sing praises to God. God does not want any one of us who are believers of the order of the Lord Jesus Christ in his priesthood and priestly service to fall for the temptation of being disappointed at ruins. You know, the world cannot do anything if the ecclesia does not speak. Why? We are the ones that, were, that, God, given the, that God gave the power to. Jesus says, all power has been given to me and I give it to you. What is that power? The power is life and death. So if we don't speak, Nothing happens. So what does Satan do? Satan holds up images in front of us. We are in a spiritual charade. Satan does not have the authority to speak. He has only craftiness. He wants you to speak. That's why I told you when the EMP was released in 2020, the emergency medical procedure, it was only possible because we have been professing EMP, thinking that we're talking about a, an electromagnetic pulse bomb. It doesn't matter what we're thinking as much as what we're saying. So what have they gotten us saying in the last couple of months? Olivia, they've been getting us to speak the word I. AI. AI. Every news feed that you see. Oh, oh AI. Oh, AI. AI. AI is the first enemy and is also the last enemy. Death is the last enemy. When death comes, you see the ruins. But from the perspective of the machining of man upon the earth, the last regiment is called I because that was the first enemy. And what does I mean? The word I is in the Bible, AI, and it means a heap of ruins. And the reason why they've been getting us to profess AI, AI, everywhere, every time, in the blogs, is because they want to bring the heap of ruins to suck the faith of people. Anyone whose trust is in mammon, anyone whose trust is in this civilization, quote unquote, anyone whose trust is in the system is about to be disappointed because everything is about to be reduced to ruins. And the Bible says it will happen in one hour, which we believe means one year. So do not let your heart be deceived. I know there's a lot that has been said today, but it just has to be said. There's a reason why God brought you here today. If he wants you to be entertained, there are preachers who are more entertaining online. There's no shortage of them. It just so happens that I am not one of them. I wanted to be. I, I used to watch people and try to talk like them. And you know, I nearly broke my ankle trying to spin around like some men of God. But I am who I am by the grace of God. So let's read 1 Corinthians 2, 12 and then break bread. Oh, okay. Uh, Isaiah is our breaking bread scripture. So let's just break bread and then, um, and then we'll see what happens from there. Receive the Lord's body and his blood. Okie dokie. Praise the Lord. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the ministry of reconciliation. We well, thank you because we are once not a people, but you have now called us your own. You have translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your dear son. If any darkness remains in us, let it be blotted out this very moment by the blood of the lamb. Because we are in the light and no darkness shall be in us. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. Um, just very quickly, someone in here, there was a coffin already prepared for you. 
And the word of the Lord says, send it back. It is no longer needed. Just because you're here today, you have encountered the resurrection power. According to Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in your mortal body, he will quicken your mortal body by his Holy Spirit. I am excited. I am delighted because we here operate in the prophetic and so we receive our miracle before we need it. Okay? That testimony that Anita shared, she didn't receive her miracle in the hospital. She went to that hospital already carrying that miracle. She only went to the hospital to birth the miracle. So you are receiving miracles in here today without even knowing it. Praise the Lord. And we will birth it in due season. Alrighty, Alan, start getting ready to come up here because you may have to come and get this mic because I feel like going on. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.12 don't forget, it says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of whom, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. I pray for you in the mighty name of Jesus. You see, this message today should be ideally four hours because the way the Lord was loading me up and the things he was showing me, Hopefully we can continue on some of these things on Tuesday, but let me just say this very quickly before we all get out of the door. I'm closing early because of my brother Thomas, because he's been here since like, what, 5.30. So it's for your sake. Otherwise, I'm going for another 30 minutes. But I want to say this very quickly. I want you to hear me good, folks. Please lean in and just hear this. The Lord says you have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit of his Anything that was not made by the Spirit of God is going down with the old world. Which is good news because certain things that have bothered you will go, but certain things that you have also come to love will go too. So you need the spirit of discernment to be able to distinguish between that which needs to go and that which needs to stay. Because remember that the tears grew alongside with the wheat and if you did not have revelation and you were the farmer, you know the wheat and the tear, they look very much alike. You could have been standing there thinking all of this is mine and the Lord is saying, no, half of it needs to go. But if you don't know that the half that is going is going for your sake, you may sorrow. Do not sorrow. I tell you again, when the, foreign, when the palace of foreigners come down, which is the banking system, do not sorrow. Let me say this. Because... Somebody came to me the other day and was like, oh, pastor, with all these things you're saying, divorce your heart from Ammon, what do we do? What do we do? Exodus 14, 14, the Lord says, do nothing because I will fight for you. The devil wants you to do something. He wants you to be agitated. The Lord says, do nothing. I got you covered. God bless you. Julie, take that. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the man of God. I'm not going to hold this. Anybody need an offering envelope? If you need one, you can just come to the front and I'll hand it to you. Hallelujah. You'll see the offering slide on the screen. Let's just give in, in faith and honor to what the Lord has done in this house tonight. To our family online, you'll see the giving details at Communion House Cash App as well as PayPal. You'll see our number there on the screen as well for Zell. Hallelujah. Yes, here you go. Hallelujah. I'll give us a couple more seconds and we will go ahead and lift up the offering. And uh, before we get into uh, the scripture, I'd love to just welcome our family here for, for the first time. Um, we're so delighted to have you here in our midst, celebrating with us, getting this word, because we know that the Lord sent you here for a purpose, you see. And uh, even after service, if this goes for anyone, if you'd like uh, for us to just touch and agree with you, I'll be over here um, if you'd like prayer. Praise God. The book of Isaiah chapter 31 Verse 5, it reads, like birds flying about, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending, he will also deliver it, passing over, 
he will preserve it. Father, there is none like you. You are the Lord of angel armies. And Father, we give you praise and thanks for your mercy, your sweet presence, oh God, that has graced us this evening. Lord, as you have searched us and as you have granted unto us light and has have made darkness light before us and has enlightened our candles, oh God, Father, we give an offering unto you. Lord, let these offerings unto you be pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet smelling. Lord, look upon your children. Father, we give you praise for you indeed are our provider, O oh God, and we shall see it this season, O oh God. We shall see the mighty and wondrous things, O oh God, you have done in behalf of your remnant. We declare unto you that all glory and honor belong to you. And everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't forget, this live stream will be available tomorrow, 6 p.m. Check it out as we've been instructed. Make notes, pause, play, pause, play. Get all that you need from this message tonight because we know so much has been said. All right? Everyone have a blessed night, and we'll see you next week.